I'm Jay Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. It's been said that traditions are inherited, established, or customary patterns of thought, action, or behavior. Sometimes they can be related to religious practices and at other times, social customs. They're not necessarily rules, maybe guidelines, that can be followed by a family or by an entire culture or society. Tradition, its literal meaning from its Latin origins is something handed over, similar to an inheritance. Putting up the Christmas tree the day after Thanksgiving and then taking it down the day after New Year's may be a family tradition. Standing and singing the national anthem at a ball game, that's a tradition embraced across the country. Seeing if Punxsutawney Phil sees his shadow on Groundhog Day, that's another tradition. Nearly any American who owned a television in the 1970s can still hear the voice of an Italian-American mother leaning out of her tenement window in Boston's North End and calling, Anthony, Anthony. The Prince Pasta commercial debuted in 1969 and aired for nearly 14 years, making something of a local and national celebrity of Anthony Martignetti, a schoolboy who had come to the U.S. with his family from Italy only three years before the commercial was filmed and who sadly passed away in 2020. To residents of Boston's Little Italy and to Anthony's family, the commercial was a source of enduring pride and for the Prince Pasta Company, it was a shrewd centerpiece of its campaign to persuade consumers to create a new tradition, that is to make Wednesdays Prince Spaghetti Day. And it worked. To television viewers who watched its nostalgic sequence of the adorable and adoring Anthony race home past market vendors and a bocce court, it held out the prospect of something more than a filling meal, the promise of security and love around a humble hearth and the tradition, the tradition of having Prince Spaghetti every Wednesday. For many, New Year's Day is like a freshly washed chalkboard. It's a clean slate signifying a new start, and it's associated with a host of traditions. It's thought that about 4,000 years ago, the ancient Babylonians were the first to make what we've come to know of as the tradition of New Year's resolutions. They were also thought to be the first to hold recorded celebrations in honor of the new year, although for them the year began not on January 1, but in mid-March when they planted their crops. During a religious festival known as Akitu, it lasted several days, they crowned a new king or reaffirmed their loyalty to the reigning one. And they made resolutions of sorts, promises to the gods to pay their debts and return any objects they'd borrowed during the preceding year. If they kept their word and abided by their promises, the gods would bestow favor on them for the coming year. And if not, they'd fall out of favor with the gods. And that may just have been how the tradition of making New Year's resolutions began. Most modern day resolutions reflect a society that for most doesn't have the same needs as the ancient Babylonians. But then again, a promise to repay a debt or return a borrowed item or to strive for better things in the coming year, they all seem somewhat timeless and universal. Many will make New Year's resolutions. However, the majority will also fail to achieve them. But making resolutions is still thought of as a good idea with plenty of positive effects. Data suggests that about a quarter of us will make some kind of a resolution, and about 20% of that quarter of us think that we'll accomplish them. If you think about it, that's something of a disheartening statistic. Of those who take the time to make a resolution, only 20% actually expect to live up to their commitment. And it seems that less than 10% will in fact be successful. And no surprise, the most popular New Year's resolutions are about self-improvement, living healthier, getting happy, losing weight, exercising, stopping smoking, reducing drinking. And here's an interesting and probably not a surprising bit of information. For years, 
during the month of January, gym and fitness club memberships and attendance increased significantly from the months beforehand. Also, not surprisingly, come February, there's something that's come to be known as fall off the wagon day, and it's an identifiable time each year when the drop in attendance at gyms and fitness centers bisects with an increase in the number of visits to fast food restaurants. So unless people have resolved to eat more fast food in February, fall off the wagon day reflects a point in time when more people have abandoned their resolve to be healthier and decided instead that it's time to have a Big Mac or Whopper. And even if you don't keep your resolutions, it's said to be helpful to make them anyways. You don't have to wait until New Year's to make them. Here's why. They may not be New Year's resolutions, but they'll have the same effect any time throughout the year. Being honest with yourself about your current condition and the need to focus on improvement and betterment, your good intentions can actually help contribute to a sense of growth, purpose, and always striving to be a better you. Shifting gears, but staying with another well-known New Year's tradition, for a lot of people, they associate the song Old Lang Syne with New Year's Eve. Old Lang Syne. For most who have sung or attempted to sing it, they probably don't have a clue what they're singing. We know the tune and maybe some of the words that have to do with old acquaintance, but really, most of us don't know what it means when we're singing the words Old Lang Syne. And that brings me to a quick digression. There's a recognized expression for when you sing the wrong lyrics to a song, even though you think you're singing the correct ones. Whether it's the fact that you misheard the words or misunderstood them, there you are singing the words wrong to your heart's content, and that's called a mondegreen. Think of a child singing the nursery rhyme, row, row, row your boat. Instead of saying the line, life is but a dream, they sing, row, row, row your boat, life's a butter dream. Billy Joel wrote a well-known song called Just the Way You Are, and there's a verse that says, I said I love you, that's forever, and this I promise from the heart. I couldn't love you any better. I love you just the way you are. Pretty clear, huh? Well, my dear late father-in-law lived in Fall River, Massachusetts, for many years and owned a large business there. And when he first heard that song, he was ecstatic that Billy Joel would have written a song about his city. So he happily sang along with that same verse, the one that had so much meaning to him about his fair city. I said I love you, that's Fall River, and this I promise from the heart, and that's Amanda Green. Back to Old Lang Syne, when the clock strikes midnight and the calendar flips to a new year and millions start singing, well, the lyrics were from a poem written in 1788 by Robert Burns, a Scottish poet, and the phrase Old Lang Syne directly translates from the Scottish language to our modern English as Old long since. Old Lang Syne, old long since. It's often interpreted in practice as old times, especially times fondly remembered or even old or long friendship and evokes feelings of nostalgia and memories of good times spent with friends. The first lines of the song, should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind, is intended to serve as a reminder to cherish those memories, making it a fitting message for New Year's Eve night and a New Year's tradition. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot and old Lang Syne? For old Lang Syne, my dear, for old Lang Syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for old Lang Syne, for old times' sake. By the way, the song's rise to fame in the U.S. was thanks in large part to Guy Lombardo, whose orchestra called the Royal Canadians were an American staple, starting with the first nationwide New Year's Eve broadcast on the radio in 1929, coming to television in 1956. He popularized the tune as the first song to play after the stroke of midnight, and he and his orchestra played it every New Year's Eve until 1977 when he passed away. And that's the tradition of singing Old Lang Syne. Cards, flowers, lots of candy, maybe stuffed animals and balloons, maybe a nice dinner, maybe even a piece of jewelry. Valentine's Day, 
February 14. Across the U.S. and many other places around the world, cards, candy, flowers, and gifts are exchanged between loved ones, all in the name of Saint Valentine. But just who was Saint Valentine, and where did the tradition and these other traditions come from? Although the origins of Valentine's Day are far from certain, one thing is, its likely origins aren't quite as rosy or romantic as we'd like to think. The starting point seems to be the Catholic Church, which has, over the centuries, recognized at least several saints named Valentine. A well-known legend has it that Valentine was a priest serving during the third century in Rome. It's been said that when the Roman Emperor Claudius II recognized that single men made better soldiers than those with wives and families, he issued a decree outlawing marriage for young men. Valentine, believing the decree was unjust, defied Claudius and continued to perform marriages for young lovers in secret. Once his defiance was discovered, though, Valentine was beheaded and his martyrdom remembered on what has come to be known as Valentine's Day. I told you, not as romantic as you might have imagined for such a sentimental holiday. As for exchanging Valentine cards, well, Valentine greetings were popular as far back as the Middle Ages, though written ones didn't begin to appear until around the year 1400. The oldest known Valentine, it's still in existence today. It was a poem written in 1415 by the Duke of Orleans to his wife while he was imprisoned in the Tower of London. Again, not quite a warm and embracing history for Valentine's Day. By 1900, printed cards began to replace written ones thanks to improvements in technology. Now, every year more than 200 million roses are grown, especially for Valentine's Day. And in the past couple of years, Americans have spent more than $1 billion a year on candy, $2 billion a year on flowers, and more than $4 billion a year on jewelry for their Valentines. The U.S. Greeting Card Association estimated that over the past several years, almost 200 million Valentines have been sent each year in the U.S. alone. And when they include those Valentine exchanges in elementary schools across the country, the number increases to about a billion Valentines a year. And on the topic of tradition and romance, when many people think of traditions, they think of marriage and weddings. It seems that the institution of marriage has been around for about 4,000 years. Early on, one of the primary purposes of a marriage was to serve as an alliance between families for either economic or political reasons, or both, and to guarantee the lineage of a man's children. Marriage, it seems, had little to do with love or with religion. More often than not, marriages were arranged by a couple's parents. The young couple had little, if any, say in the matter. Through marriage, a woman became a man's property. Ouch. And even today, in some cultures and religions, marriages are arranged on much the same basis. And romantic love? Well, that concept didn't even enter the picture as a motivating force until well into the Middle Ages. So here are a few of the more interesting origins of some of the well-known wedding traditions, starting, let's say, with the wedding veil worn by many brides. It's been said that the tradition of a bride wearing a veil dates back to ancient times when brides were wrapped from head to toe possibly to represent the delivery of a modest and untouched maiden, and possibly to hide her from evil spirits who might want to thwart her happiness. It's also been said that the tradition finds its roots in arranged marriages, when a groom's family would not permit him to see his bride until after the couple had officially wed, just in case he didn't like her looks, and there was a chance, no matter how slim, that he might change his mind and refuse to marry her. So the veil, it seems, was worn not just to ward off evil spirits, but to conceal the bride's appearance right up until the last possible moment. As for those bridemaids, all wearing similar, never-to-be-worn-again dresses, it seems that long ago they would actually wear the very same dress as the bride, identical. Once again, in order to confuse those apparently not-too-bright evil spirits, and prevent them from finding the bride and cursing her on her wedding day. Because weddings really were a part of a business transaction and not a union of love, the groom also needed to find himself a good swordsman to help deal with the transaction. 
whether it was dealing with the bride's displeased family or possibly finding a runaway bride who might choose not to consent to the union. Something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. Where did that tradition come from? Well, the old signifies the old ties to the bride's family and her past. The new, that reflects the new life ahead of them. Something borrowed, that's to have an item from someone who's in a successful marriage pass on their good fortune. And something blue is to signify loyalty, purity, and faithfulness. Like so many of our traditions today, wedding and engagement rings can also be traced to ancient Rome. Roman women often wore rings of ivory, flint, bone, copper, and iron to signify a business contract or to affirm her obedience. Gold rings were later found in the ruins of Pompeii, proving the shiny metal became the material of choice in the common era. The wedding rings that were worn by women were often iron when at home and gold when in public. But what about that tradition of spending a couple of months' salary and proposing with a sparkling diamond engagement ring? Interestingly, that tradition arose not from any ancient religious or cultural foundation, and unlike other wedding traditions, it doesn't date to the days of the ancient Romans or Greeks. It's actually a function of some very creative advertising. It seems that in the late 19th century, a conglomerate of diamond mining companies in South Africa conjured up what's come to be known as the diamond invention. It's a wholly creative and invented idea that diamonds are far more rare and far more valuable than they really were and that they were somehow symbols of lofty esteem. The British businessmen operating those South African diamond mines recognized that only by creating the fiction that diamonds were unusually rare and scarce and therefore inherently valuable, could they protect their investment and artificially keep afloat diamond prices? So fast forward to 1938, amid the ravages of the Great Depression and the rumblings of war, a fellow by the name of Harry Oppenheimer, a son of the De Beers Diamond Company founder, recruited a New York-based advertising agency to improve the image of diamonds in the United States. It seems that up until that point in time, the practice of giving diamond engagement rings had been inconsistent. That is, engagement rings were made of a variety of gems and precious metals. And when diamonds were given, they were generally small in size and low in quality. And so as the price of diamonds was falling around the world, this advertising agency devised a campaign intended to persuade young men that diamonds, and only diamonds, were synonymous with true romance. The ad campaign conveyed the message that the real measure of a man's love and an accurate reflection of his personal and professional success were tied to the size and quality of the diamond he purchased. And young women, they were soon convinced that a successful courtship concluded with a nice diamond on her finger. So with the help of Hollywood stars, and the slogan, a diamond is forever, diamond engagement rings skyrocketed in popularity. Movie stars and idols, the paragons of romance for the mass audience, they were given diamonds to use as symbols of indestructible love. They were photographed with diamond engagement rings prominently featured. And the truth is that while diamonds are one of the hardest known substances on earth, they're not forever. They're not indestructible. They can be shattered, chipped, discolored, or incinerated to ash. But the concept that a diamond is forever perfectly captures the magical qualities that the advertising agency wanted, not necessarily the reality. A diamond that lasts forever promises endless romance and companionship and is one that's not likely to be resold because of that romantic element. And it seems that resold diamonds cause fluctuations in diamond prices, which in turn undermine public confidence in that intrinsic value of diamonds. And that's not something that the diamond mining companies wanted. So that diamonds that are stowed away in a safe deposit box or given to grandchildren and passed on from generation to generation, they won't cause any fluctuation in diamond prices. And on the subject of spending by Americans on something millions of people enjoy, here are some interesting statistics about another American tradition. 
Halloween, starting point. In 2021, consumer spending on Halloween-related items reached an all-time high of more than $10 billion, with about $3 billion of that on candy alone. On average, consumers spend about $100 on costumes, candy, decorations, greeting cards. The top ways Americans have traditionally celebrated Halloween include handing out candy, the tradition of trick-or-treating, decorating our homes or yards, the tradition of dressing in costumes, and carving a pumpkin. The origins of trick-or-treating remain a bit murky, but it's thought it can be traced to early Celtic festivals, Roman Catholic holidays, and even medieval practices. The early Celts, who lived a couple of thousand years ago in the area that's now Ireland and the United Kingdom and northern France, believed that the dead returned to earth on the day known as Samhain. On that sacred night, people gathered to light bonfires, offer sacrifices, and pay homage to the dead. During some Celtic celebrations of Samhain, villagers disguised themselves in costumes made of animal skins to drive away phantom visitors. Banquet tables were prepared and food was left out to placate unwelcome spirits. And in later centuries, people began dressing as ghosts, demons, and other malevolent creatures, performing antics in exchange for food and drink. And that was called mumming, which is thought to be the basis for our trick-or-treating. And by 1000 AD, the Catholic Church called November 2nd All Saints, I'm sorry, All Souls Day, a time for honoring the dead. And celebrations throughout England resemble that Celtic commemoration of Samhain, complete with bonfires and masquerades. It seems that poor people would visit the houses of wealthier families and receive pastries called soul cakes in exchange for a promise to pray for the souls of the homeowner's dead relatives. And that custom became known as souling and was later taken up by children who would go from door to door asking for gifts, food, money, even ale. Think trick or treat. And here's another tradition. Whether it's sticking out your tongue to welcome someone in Tibet, or touching noses, shoulders, or foreheads, or bowing to one another when meeting, there are countless greeting customs and traditions around the world. One tradition that's been around for a very long time, but has fallen by the wayside these days, is the practice of shaking hands. The tradition of shaking someone's hand when meeting has become so ubiquitous and commonplace that most of us have given no thought to its origins, which once again can be traced to the ancient Greeks. In Greece, it was viewed as a symbol of peace. In medieval Europe, knights would extend their right hand to show they were unarmed. There, knights would often carry their swords in a case called a scabbard on their left side. This meant that they could draw their sword with their right hand if it was needed. Shaking hands, which is traditionally done with one's right hand, became a friendly greeting because it was proof that someone came in peace and was not holding a weapon. It was also a sign of trust that you believed the other person wasn't going to take their sword out to fight you either. Here's an interesting one. Most of us are familiar with the tradition of throwing salt over your shoulder if you spilled it. Is that a tradition or a superstition? References to salt and its significance in culture dates back thousands of years. The first written reference to salt is found in the book of Job, recorded about 2250 BC, and there are many references to salt throughout the Bible. Possibly the most familiar one being the story of Lot's wife, who was turned into a pillar of salt when she disobeyed the angels and looked back at the wicked city of Sodom. From ancient times to the present, the importance of salt to humans and animals has been recognized. Thousands of years ago, animals created paths to salt licks, and men followed them seeking game and salt, and those trails became roads. And besides the road, grew settlements, then cities. And the expression, he's not worth his salt, is a common expression that originated in ancient Greece, where salt was traded for slaves. The early Greeks worshiped salt as much as they did the sun, and had a saying that no one should trust a man without first eating a peck of salt with him, suggesting that by the time you've shared a peck of salt with someone, they're no longer your stranger. And here's one. The origin of the term salary comes from the Latin word for salt, sal, 
Roman soldiers were said to be paid partially in salt rations, which explains where we get the expression, worth one's salt, which gets us to the widespread tradition or superstition that spilling salt brings bad luck. That's believed to have originated with the overturned salt cellar in front of Judas at the Last Supper, an incident immortalized in Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, The Last Supper. And there are a host of traditions associated with spilled salt. According to an old Norwegian superstition, a person will shed as many tears as will be necessary to dissolve the salt they spilled. An old English belief has it that every grain of salt spilled represents future tears. The Germans believe that whoever spills salt arouses hostility and animosity because it's thought to be the direct act of the devil, the peace disturber. And the French throw a little spilled salt behind them in order to hit the devil in the eye to temporarily prevent further mischief. In the United States, their tradition has become to toss a pinch of salt over your left shoulder if you spilled some. Well, why is it? Well, it's because it's been said that the devil tends to attack from behind. And why the left shoulder? Because the devil might also attack from the left side, and the left side is the sinister side. And in fact, the Latin word for left, or on the left side, is sinistra. Sinister, if you will. How's that for a tradition? And there's a good chance that if you hear achoo, you'll say, bless, or God bless you. Some will say Gesundheit, which is a term borrowed from German meaning health, and is believed to forestall whatever illness the sneeze may portend. The tradition of saying bless you or God bless you after someone sneezes seems to be almost a reflex response. We may feel compelled to say it to anyone who sneezes, even if they're a complete stranger, and sometimes even if they're at quite a distance. And have you ever said bless you to a, a pet that sneezed? Saying God bless you after someone has sneezed is so common and has been taught to us since we were children. It's another one of those traditions that most people don't think of as a blessing, but instead as a simple polite utterance in response to a sneeze. The tradition has been effectively conditioned into most of us. You hear a sneeze, you say God bless you. Not a moment's thought. There are times when you don't even have a clue who has sneezed, and yet you're still saying, God bless you. And just as you may subconsciously say, God bless, when you hear a sneeze, the sneezer may promptly say, excuse me, or thank you, without conscious thought. And there again, most people today aren't even sure why they're saying, God bless you. And they may never have stopped to consider why. They're afraid that if they don't say it, people will either think that they're rude or that they don't care about the person who sneezed. It's been said that historically sneezes were thought to be an omen or a warning from the gods. For European Christians, when the first plague weakened the Christian Roman Empire around 590, Pope Gregory the Great believed that a sneeze was an early warning sign of the plague. So he commanded Christians to respond to every sneeze with a blessing. And in ancient times, people believed that sneezing would allow evil spirits to enter your body, and saying, God bless you, kept those evil spirits away. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed this, and I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And consider what the great composer Gustav Mahler said about tradition. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire.